Okay. So, now we're moving on to financial statement and ratio analysis. And, uh, by the way, this is, it was important for you to know chapter two before this, because uh, we're going to be using a lot of those financial statements. Why are financial statement, why is financial statement ratio analysis important? Because we need to make comparisons. We need to make comparisons between organizations and for the same organization over time. And the problem is this, organizations can be in the same business but have different scale. And so we can't just say, well, wait a minute, this company has more net income than this one, so it must be operating better. You can't say that because the one with the higher net income might be huge and the one with the slightly less net income might be tiny. And so we're going to have to uh, figure out how to compare for those. And the first way, uh, oh, actually, I'll give you an example here. I worked for a company, last company I worked for, named American in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, or as local would say, Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. And they were in the plastic additives business. And across town in Akron, we had a big competitor that was publicly traded called Poly One. And Poly One, uh, because they're publicly traded, we have access to all their financial statements. But being small and privately held, they didn't have access to ours. So we could actually do this kind of analysis on them, but they could not do it on us. One of the benefits of being private. Okay, now let's talk about um, differences that you might see between these. Who do you think had more assets, American or Poly One? Yeah, Poly One, very definitely. Um, so we know they're bigger, that they're also going to have higher sales, they're definitely going to have higher net income, but we need to be able to compare between the two. So as we go through here, I will try to highlight situations where uh, the comparisons are fair and then some where they're not so fair. Okay, so let's talk about our first and easiest way, and that is through something called common sized financial statements. By the way, what are the financial statements that we tend to talk about? Balance sheet. Balance sheet. What else? Income statement. Income statement and? Cash. Yeah, statement of cash flows. Those are the big three. Now, uh, common sized financial statements, we're going to focus on the balance sheet and on the income statement. And for each of those, we are going to find a single number to divide everything by. And on the balance sheet, it's real easy. It's just total assets. We divide everything there by total assets. By the way, remember, on the balance sheet, we've got total assets over here. We've got total liabilities and total equity over here. What do these two things add together to be? Yeah, it's got to be total assets, right? Otherwise, it's an unbalanced sheet, and we don't like that. Okay, so we're going to divide every single thing here, and we're going to have everything in terms of um, a percentage of assets. Now, what does that mean? You could go through and look at things like inventory. What's inventory as a percentage of assets? Well, we've got 17% uh, of our assets are invested in inventory, but Poly One only has 5% of their assets invested in inventory. Is it possible that we have an inventory problem? Oh, definitely, right? And we could also go through and we could look at our long-term debt as a proportion of the total assets. And we see that our long-term debt is 20% of our assets, but at Poly One, that it's 40% of the assets. Now, can we both be optimally, capitally structured for this industry? Absolutely not. We need to figure out basically who's closer to being right. Of course, we need to go out and look at other people in the industry at that point to figure out what is that optimal capital structure. So that's something else that we could look at. Okay, now let's talk about uh, looking at the income statement. If I'm going to take the income statement and find one single number to divide everything out there by, yeah, it's going to be sales. Now, here's the problem. If you look at an income statement for, I guarantee you, if you went out and looked at four different companies, that top line would have four different names. So it could be total sales, uh, and that's typical with industries that don't have a lot of returns. But what about retail? What do you think we report in retail? Returns. 
Yeah, we got to subtract out the returns, right? So we, we've got net sales there. Now let me illustrate to you how important it is to do net sales for retail. My wife likes to wear clothes from China. However, my wife is American. So she's American size, not Chinese size. And so when she sees stuff on Amazon that she likes, she goes out and she buys three of whatever it is. She gets an extra large, an extra, extra large, and an extra, extra, extra large. Keep in mind, these are Chinese sizes, right? And then she gets them and she tries them on. How many of those does she keep at most? One. And so basically she's returning two thirds of the items that she buys. And so uh, Amazon could say, well, she's spending $3,000 a year with us if they looked at total sales, but in truth, they're only getting $1,000 a year out of her, right? And so that's why in retail we talk about net sales. Now, what about companies that provide a service? You might see uh, total revenue. And so you're going to see lots and lots of different names, but here's what you need to know. In order to do a common size income statement, we always just divide everything by the top line. We always just divide everything by the top line. Okay, now if you think your way down the income statement, um, the first thing that we're going to subtract out, come on in, I, uh, he had permission to come in late, I said I wouldn't shame him, so no shame. Okay, so you, uh, I did lose my train of thought though. Okay, we're working our way down the income statement. And the first thing that gets subtracted out is the cost of goods sold. And so the cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales, even after we've done the common size income statement, might be different between companies of different size. And here's why. Think about my example. My, our company, Americam, we would buy stuff in 55-pound bags, which is 25 kilograms, because the jobs that we were doing were small. Across town, they were buying, uh, Poly One was buying their, the base plastic, one rail car at a time. Who do you think was paying more per pound for their material? Yeah, we were. Who do you think had a higher percentage cost of goods sold? We did, right? And so uh, that's one of those areas where uh, you just can't get away from that simply because of the scale of the business. There are economies of scale. By the way, we could have also bought stuff. There was a rail spur right there at our plant. We could have also bought rail cars full of it. What would the problem have been then? I gotta have some place to put it, right? Uh, they had silos, but those silos would empty fairly quickly. And so their inventory remained quite low comparatively. Uh, if we got a rail car, it might have lasted us 15 years. And so it's, in, it's uh, just the cost of doing business at a small scale that we had to pay extra per pound for our raw materials. So don't freak out if those are different. Okay, now moving on down, we have S, G, and A, selling general and administrative expenses. If you had to guess, what kinds of things go into selling general and administrative expenses? Advertising. Advertising, I like that. What else? Product cost, like um, related to the cost related to the product uh, manufacturing or so. Oh no, that's going to be all in cost of goods sold. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's think through it. Selling, general and administrative. Commissions. Yeah, commissions for salespeople. Also the um, salary. Yeah, the salary for salespeople and their travel expenses. Yeah are all in there. By the way, we talked about the agency problem and about salespeople. Do you think salespeople take advantage of the fact that they are on an expense account? Oh, yeah. Do you think it occasionally can get out of hand? Oh, yeah. Do you think occasionally we have to tighten the belt and have the big talk? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things we're looking at here, uh, oh, oh, let's talk about general and administrative expenses. Um, basically, anything that can't be tied to the product, any cost that can't be tied to the product is in here. And also, uh, like the administrative staff. Point of sales systems as I go in general admission or as I go cost and sold? 
That would be underselling general administrative. Yeah. I love the, the how do you, what's the abbreviation for point of sale system? POS. POS. And how often are they actually POSs? All the time. All the time. Just cracks me up. By the way, if you don't know what a POS is, ask an American friend. Okay, so back to, I said it about a car in the last meeting that we had. So back to the story. Um, is it possible that uh, our selling general administrative expenses might be too high? Absolutely. And so it's good to compare between companies. In fact, I would say, uh, I would, if I look at this university, do you know, if you could guess, what percentage of the pay at the university actually goes to your professors? 32%. Yeah, so it's like 30, 35%. So where is the value created at this university? It's in the interaction between the professor and the student, right? And yet 65% of the money that we're spending basically is selling general and administrative expense. What do you think's happened over time? Do you think in the beginning it was that way? No, in the beginning, they were like, it's kind of like when I went to grade school. We had the, the teachers, and we had one principal, and we had one secretary, and that was it. There were no nurses, there were no para profession, none of that stuff, right? But over time, it's just getting bloat, bloat, bloat. Companies do the same thing. But here's the cool thing about companies. They have a profit motive. Eventually, things will get to the point that someone says, hey, we need to tighten our belts, and you'll hear that expression. Usually, it's when there's a downturn in sales. So when things are really, really good, what happens is companies get fat. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger with this bloat. And then when sales downturn, uh, of course, they're not going to fire the people that are actually producing the value. What do they do? They start to get rid of these people who are in non-value add positions. And they also do away with things like the free coffee, things like that, just to send the signal that folks were tightening our belt. The problem when you get into institutions like this one, there's no profit motive, right? And so when, when you have a downturn in sales here, what do we do? Sales, by the way, tuition revenue, tuition stuff. What do we do? We go to the state and say, hey, would you, could you give us more money, please? Please, please, please. And as long as we get more money from the state, guess what? We don't go through and clean up any of our messes. We don't cut out any of the, of the wasteful spending. Okay, so. Don't they raise the tuition or the state may mandate that you raise the tuition? Okay, so we are allowed to raise tuition, but only up to the CPI, and we almost never do that. So the tuition raises that you guys are paying, uh, we have become more and more dependent on state over the last few years. Oh yeah, the, the state, by the way, the taxpayers are paying for about 35% of your education if you're a Missouri State resident. Okay, back to the story. So you can look at SGA, compare our percentage to another company in the same industry. By the way, you always want to do it within the same industry. And if yours is extraordinarily high, maybe you've got a problem, right? Okay, and then moving on down, um, I don't know that depreciation is all that uh, meaningful on this, but you think about uh, these different things and you can compare them and see whether you're doing better or worse. Any questions about common size financial statements? If I wanted to find the common size value of inventory, what would I divide by? Assets. Assets, right? And if I want to find the common size value of sales general and administrative expenses, what would I divide by? Yes. Yeah, that top line. Now, sometimes you want to compare things, you want to look at performance on things, and you can't just do it based on one financial statement. And so the common size financial statement doesn't necessarily give you the full picture. For example, uh, in inventory. Where is, which financial statement would I look at to find inventory? Balance. Yeah, the balance sheet, right? And where, by the way, the only purpose for inventory in the universe at all is to create sales, right? If we weren't going to sell anything, we wouldn't want to have any inventory. And so if I want to look at how the performance of inventory is going, I want to look at the sales. What, in, what statement would I have to look at in order to find sales? Income. 
Yeah, the income statement. And so you're not going to be able to judge inventory performance in full without crossing between those two statements. And that's where we get into these financial ratios. Now, financial ratios, we're using them for a lot of different reasons. Um, first of all, there's competitive analysis, which I was just explaining with American and Poly 1. They can also be used for internal analysis. Once per month, my accountant, a man, and this is at Halliburton in Dallas, Texas, my accountant, a man named Jack Heffelfinger, he would have all of these ratios calculated for my little $12 million a year business, and he would call me in, and we would talk about my performance, and he would use the ratios to show me whether I was getting better or getting worse. So that's internal analysis. And then there's external analysis. Does anyone here know what a CFA is? What's that? Uh, certified financial analyst. Close. Chartered financial analyst. They like to mix it up just so you know you can tell the, the people on the inside versus not. Yeah, chartered financial analysts. And what they do is they try to analyze all the publicly available information about a company to determine whether or not or whether you should buy, sell, or hold, right? And so you hear these financial analysts and they'll be re either recommending a stock or telling you to, when they say to underweight a stock, that means to sell. When they say overweight a stock, that means to buy. And if they're neutral, that means hold. So we've changed the words from ones that everyone could understand, buy, hold, and sell, to ones that almost no one understands, overweight, neutral, and underweight. Okay, so that's external analysis. And there are other people who are interested in external analysis. For instance, our suppliers would be interested in knowing our financial situation. Why? Go ahead. Uh, so they can more accurately predict how much you're going to buy from them and you get a better understanding of your business interaction? Oh, that's a, that's a little beyond. Yes, because they're selling to you on credit, remember? They're more interested in whether you can pay, right? Now, forecasting is what you're talking about, and that would be of secondary importance, but it's definitely important. Okay, now, what about banks? Ms. Armbrister, why do you think the bank might be concerned about my financial health? So you're going to loan money to a friend. Yeah. If you're going to loan money to a friend, don't you want to know whether they have a job or not? Whether they're going to be able to pay you back? Does that make sense? Okay, and then bondholders. Bondholders are lenders to the firm, but they're just the, in, in the public at large. And so they have the same concern as the bank. And by the way, the suppliers are interested in short term, right? Because they've loaned you money basically on a 30, 60, or 90 day time frame. And so as long as you're going to be healthy for the next year, they're fine. Uh, what about banks and bondholders? Interest. Yeah, well, they might be interested in longer periods, right? And we're going to show that we have different ratios for these different occasions. So everything that I show you today, I'm going to show you ratios that are in families. And if I were you, when you're preparing your note sheet for the exam, by the way, the note sheet for the exam, handwritten both sides. You can write anything you want on there. It could be in Chinese, Vietnamese, English, Spanish, I don't care, right? Uh, but it needs to be handwritten. And the reason I insist on a handwritten note sheet is because of something called kinetic learning. Ms. Wen, Ms. Wen, Ms. Wen, do you have a question? Thank you. Okay, the reason I ask you to write this stuff down is because between coming through your eyes and coming out of your hand, where does it have to pass through? Your brain. What if I just said, oh, well, Ms. Armbruster can write the note sheet and then you all can just Xerox it? Who's going to be getting a little learning out of that? She will, and you guys won't know squat, right? So that's why we do a handwritten note sheet. Now, all that said, why am I telling you that? Because when I, when I want you to fill out your note sheet for the next exam, what I want you to do is put these financial ratios in the families and keep the families together. Now, families, uh, the people in your family, they're related, but they're not identical, right? 
My sister and I are related, but we are not identical. You could tell she's a sister, it's not an identical twin, right? Um, so we are not identical. So when we start looking at these families, I want you to think of them as being, the ratios of being like brothers and sisters or cousins, but they are not exactly the same thing. They all have to measure something a little different. Now let's start with our short-term solvency or liquidity measures. If something is liquid, so liquidity is basically talking about your ability to pay your bills over the short term. What is the short term in finance and accounting? Yeah, yeah, up to one year, right? And so we're talking about things that are, we're examining up to one year. And that means we're going to be focusing on uh, the current assets and current liabilities. And so the current ratio basically is just taking your current assets and dividing it by your current liabilities. Let's do a refresher on what current assets and current liabilities are. Current assets are things we expect to produce cash within the next year. Current assets are things we expect to produce cash within the next year. Current liabilities are things we expect to consume cash within the next year. Current liabilities are things we expect to consume cash within the next year. Now, let's talk about probabilities. What is the probability that a current liability will actually consume cash within the next year? It's almost 100%, right? This is a bill you owe. Now, let's talk about current assets and why they might not all produce cash within the next year. What about inventory? Is it possible that you won't sell all your inventory over the next year? Yeah. What about accounts receivable? Is it possible you won't collect all of your accounts receivable over the next year? Yeah, we have late pays and we have deadbeats. And so we, uh, we know that we're a whole lot more likely to have to pay our current liabilities than we are to collect those current assets. Now, knowing all that, let's think about what a current ratio, a healthy current ratio, would look like. We know it needs to be at least greater than one. If this thing is exactly one, it means that I can pay all of my bills over the coming year, assuming that all the current assets turn into cash. And we just said that that's not true. And so this thing needs to be greater than one. It needs to be greater than one. Now, I just mentioned already that inventory might not turn into cash. So I'll give you an example of when I worked at Halliburton. We had some parts on the shelf for a pump that we had not manufactured since 1957. And the only, so we had spare parts on the shelf, and the only place in the world that was still using these pumps was Vietnam. Now, unfortunately, the United States and Vietnam had a disagreement back in the 60s and 70s. We still didn't have normal trade relations with Vietnam. Were those parts ever going to sell? No, not until we normalized trade relations with Vietnam, and we had no idea how long that was going to be, right? And so those parts definitely did not sell within one year. They didn't sell within two years. They didn't sell within 10 years. They didn't sell within 20 years, right? And so not all of your inventory is going to sell every year. Now, is there some inventory that sells more than once per year? Oh, yeah. Go to, go to the grocery store and look at the milk and ask yourself, has that been here 11 months? I should hope not, right? Because it would be very bad. Now, what I'm telling you is that we're looking at basically, uh, on average, how long is the stuff staying in there. And that's, that some of it's not going to turn into cash within the year. Now, how can we handle that? Well, we can look at something called the quick ratio or acid test. And basically, all we're doing is subtracting out the inventory from the current assets. Now, let's talk about this. We've got current assets is equal to, uh, what all goes into current assets? Well, we've got cash. Inventory receivable. Yeah, accounts, accounts receivable plus inventory. inventory. Now, we, on the top here, we have current assets minus inventory. If I do a minus inventory over here, what happens? They just cancel out, right? And we end up with cash plus accounts receivable. But all too often, here's what students do. 
They say, well, uh, current assets minus inventory is going to be cash plus accounts receivable minus inventory. And then they're going to get a wrong answer. By the way, do you think that wrong answer will be one of the choices? <laughs> Probably. We call it a close distractor, right? It's what separates the A's from the B's. Now, or the B's from the C's, right? And so, just keep in mind that when you see current, uh, current assets minus inventory, it's just cash plus AR. Don't let that freak you out. Now, a quick ratio uh, of greater than one. Here's what that means. I can pay all of my bills for the coming year without selling another single piece of my inventory. I can pay all of my bills for the next coming year without selling another single piece of my inventory. In a healthy organization, are you going to sell some of your inventory? Yeah. And so you don't necessarily have to have a quick ratio greater than one. In fact, I'll bet if you went out and looked at Walmart, they would have a quick ratio less than one. And then we have the cash ratio, which is just cash divided by current liabilities. If the cash ratio is greater than one, that means that I can pay all of my bills over the coming year without selling another single piece of my inventory or collecting a single dollar in accounts receivable from my customers. In other words, I can do it just with the cash on hand. If a company is healthy, they are going to be selling some of their inventory, they are going to be uh, recovering part of those accounts receivable, and so a cash ratio greater than one would actually res uh, represent a bad thing. And here's why. Think about the returns that we get on our different investments. If we, if you, think about your own personal life. You can choose to put your money in the S&P 500, and in last year you would have gotten 24% return. Or you could put it in the money market, which is the short-term cash, and get between 4 and 5%. You see that cash is actually a poor investment. Cash is a poor investment. And so if we've got a cash ratio greater than 1, it means the company is holding too much cash. The company is holding too much cash. There is such a thing as holding too much cash. By the way, why do companies typically carry too much cash? Uh, usually, it's when the entrepreneur that started the company is still in charge. So, let's discuss Apple. As long as Steve Jobs was in charge, Apple just always carried way too much cash. Now, it's a psychological issue. If you think back to how Apple got started, uh, was Steve Jobs independently wealthy? No. He was adopted by a working class family. Lovely people, but they didn't have any money to really help him out. In the beginning, do you think he could go to the banker and say, hey, I want to build this thing called a desktop computer? Would the bankers have even known what the hell that was? No, to a banker, it's a room. A computer is in a room, right? It, it's expensive and, and it's not going to work. So they're going to tell Steve no. And so Steve has to scratch and beg for every penny that he needs to get this business started. Do you think that ever really leaves the entrepreneur's mind this fear of not having enough cash? No, it stays with them their whole life. And then eventually, when a professional manager takes over, someone like Tim Cook, uh, Tim Cook grew up in industry where he always had access to capital if he needed it and he had a good business case, right? So Tim Cook doesn't share those same uh, fears that Steve Jobs did, and so that's why you see Apple today carrying less cash than it did back when Steve Jobs was in charge. By the way, finance is a social science. I don't know if you guys figured that, knew that, but it blew my mind the first time I heard that. But it's because it's all about interactions between people. Every transaction is an interaction between two people. And that transaction gets determined by the psychology of the two people. And so these are things that we have to take into account. So who's going to care about these short-term measures? Well, first of all, suppliers because they're extending us credit on a 30, 60, 90 day time frame. By the way, these uh, measures are all within the next year. 
if I am healthy enough to cover my bills within the next year, would it be safe to loan me money for 30, 60, 90 days? I would hope so, right? And then other short-term creditors. So basically anybody loaning you money on less than one year basis. So we have this um, commercial paper market. Commercial paper is unregistered short-term debt of these big publicly traded companies. So it's always 270 days or less because if you go to 271 days, then you have to register the issue with the Securities and Exchange Commission. So it's a whole lot cheaper to issue 270 day debt versus 271. And so people go out and they will loan companies money for 270 days. Those people are short term creditors and they would also be interested in these measures. Any questions? Okay. Now, we are on to another family. It's the long-term solvency measure. Solvency is another way of being able to say that you can pay your bills. In fact, when a company, we say it's insolvent, that's another way of saying they can't pay their bills, which is another way of saying they are bankrupt, right? So these are measures of the ability to, of positive ability to pay your bills. Long-term means greater than one year. And in this case, we have uh, two subfamilies. So we've got the leverage measures, which you can think of as brothers and sisters. And we've got the interest coverage measures, which you can think of as brothers and sisters. And you can think of those two subfamilies being cousins. But they're all focused on measuring the company's ability to pay back their long-term debt. So let's start with, oh, by the way, leverage. Uh, if you are, if you grew up in a British system, you may have heard it called gearing. But we're going to, anything where you, anytime you've got debt in your capital structure, we say you are using leverage. Anytime you've got debt in your capital structure, we say you're using leverage. And the more, the greater the percentage debt you have in your capital structure, the greater your, lever, your leverage. And if you've got too much debt in your capital structure, we say you are over levered, over levered. Okay, so there's some uh, term terminology for you. Let's start with the total debt ratio. It's just actually total debt divided by total assets. But notice that we've got total assets minus total equity divided by total assets. And the reason that may be a better equation for students is if you do it with the total debt over total assets formula, a lot of times what students do is they only look at the long-term debt. It doesn't include the current liabilities. But if you take total assets minus total equity, you not only get the long-term debt, you also pick up those current liabilities. And so this is a way to avoid that mistake by taking total assets minus total equity. But if you can remember that total debt is the current liabilities plus the long-term debt, more power to you. Okay, now, here's my question. Who would you rather loan money to? And, and, and it's two identical companies. One of them has a total debt ratio of 0 0.10, and one of them has a total debt ratio of 0 0.70. To whom would you rather lend money? Yeah, the 0.10, why? It has less debt. It has less debt. Now, let's think about what, why that's meaningful for someone who's loaning money. If I've got 0.10 and 0.70, and if, if this person, he's got 0.70, he owes money to everyone in town. She owes money to only a very few people. Even if everything else is identical, who is more likely to pay their debt? She is, right? And if you ever forget about this, just ask yourself. You've got two friends who are both asking you to borrow 100 bucks. One of them owes money to everyone in town. The other one owes money to no one. Who would you rather loan to? You'd always loan, rather loan to someone with less debt. And then we have the debt-to-equity ratio. And that's just total debt over total equity. I don't personally like debt to equity ratio, uh, but I teach it to you because you're going to hear about it a lot. You're going to hear people talk about it. Here's why I don't like it. 
Let's talk about a company. They've got a total debt ratio of 0.5, which means it's half debt, half equity. Their debt to equity ratio is one. Now, let's assume that that company goes uh, from 50% debt up to 60% debt. Their total debt ratio goes from 0.5 to 0.6, which is only a 20% increase. But look at what happens to debt to equity ratio. Now we've got 0.6 over 0.4, so it's 1.5. So a 20% jump in the total debt ratio creates this nonlinear 50% jump in the debt to equity ratio. I don't like that, but since everyone talks about this, I'm teaching it to you. Now, what about the equity multiplier? Um, this is usually when we talk about the, the quintessential measure of leverage, this is what we're talking about. It's the equity multiplier, and that is total assets over total equity. Total assets over total equity. But a fun thing to know is that total assets over total equity is actually equal to one plus the debt to equity ratio. And I'm gonna prove that to you right now. Okay, so we have total assets is equal to total debt plus total equity. Does that look familiar? Okay, now, if I want to get the equity multiplier, all I have to do is divide by total equity. In algebra, as long as I do the same thing to both sides, it's all fine. What happens here? Yeah, it goes to one, right? And so basically, we end up with this equity multiplier being one plus the debt to equity ratio. Now, why is that important? Because sometimes you're going to be doing calculations and you're going to say, well, I need the equity multiplier, but all that jerk gave me is the debt to equity ratio. And as soon as that thought goes through your head, here's what I want you to remember. Aha! The equity multiplier is just one plus the debt to equity ratio. The equity multiplier is just one plus the debt to equity ratio. Plus current liabilities. Oh, in this equation? Yes. Even though we talk about long term, but we... It's total debt. The T is for total. It's all of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. More than once we are going to cause you grief with this yeah, thing. Why, why, why do they don't use total liability? Why change to that? Oh, why don't you call it total liability? Yeah, because... You can if you like. Equation. Yeah, yeah. feel free to interpret it however, or you just name it however you like to help you remember what it is. Yeah, you're absolutely right, it is total liabilities. Because uh, we could owe money in taxes and we could have a, a, a tax, a deferred tax liability and that would actually not be debt per se, right? But it would still be in our total debt ratio. Okay, now. These leverage measures, the higher they are, the more debt you have. The higher they are, the more debt you have, and the less attractive you are as a borrower. The higher these numbers are, the less attractive you are as a borrower, because you owe money to more people. You talking about the multiplier? The higher the multiplier number is? All three of those oh, ratios, all three. all three of those top long-term solvency measures, the higher they are, the more debt you've got, the worse, let's, let's say the worse your credit rating is. Does that make sense? Yeah, higher debt makes all of those things higher. Now, the reason I nail that point home is because these next measures are actually better when they are higher. These next measures are actually better when they are higher. And these are called the interest coverage measures. How, how able am I to pay my interest over the coming year? What is my ability to pay my interest over the coming year? Now you say, wait a minute, 
When I pay back borrowed money, there are two things I'm paying back. What are they? Principal and interest. Yeah, principal and interest. But this, these measures have nothing to do with principal. You say, well, wait a minute. Why, why is that the case? And here's the answer. Most corporate debt is interest only debt and it pays back the principal, remaining principal, all the principal at the end. So for instance, on a bond, uh, you pay the coupons all along, they represent interest, but at the very end you have to pay the face value, which is the principal. Yes, sir? Did you say ability to pay interest within the year? Or? Within the year, yeah. Thanks. Oh, sh yes. These are within the year. Thanks for pointing that out. And we're going to talk about why that is. We're going to talk about why that is. But, and we'll also talk about why the long-term people are interested in these seemingly short-term measures. Okay, now, the first one is the times interest earned, or TIE measure. And the TIE measure is EBIT. By the way, what does EBIT stand for? Yeah, earnings before interest in taxes. Now, if I pronounced it for you one way, you would say, no, it's, so for example, anytime I would say that it's EBIT, someone's going to say, no, 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 it's EBIT. And if I say it's EBIT, someone's going to say, no, 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 it's EBIT. So what do I do? I just say E-B-I-T, and then you all can argue amongst yourselves as to what's appropriate. I'm not going to tell you. I don't know, apparently. Okay, now, it's earnings before interest in tax. Now, you say, wait a minute. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about what's good here. If e, B, if this thing, this TIE, is greater than one, it is evidence that you will be able to pay all of your interest over the coming year. If this thing is greater than one, that's evidence you're going to be able to pay your interest over the coming year. And you say, wait a minute. E, B, I, T is earnings before interest and taxes. Well, what about the taxes that you owe? Let's consider this situation. What if your EBIT was exactly the amount of interest that you owe? After you subtract out the interest, what is your taxable income? Zero. What are the taxes on zero? Zero. Do you see how that works? And so even if this thing were just one, we would be fine. But I'll tell you, oh, by the way, as a, as a lender to these people, you would rather this number be higher because you want someone to be able to make three, four, five times the amount of interest that they owe you just to make sure that they could pay, right? So you would be thrilled to see that number be higher. Now, what about uh, the cash coverage ratio? Well, some people say, wait a minute. Depreciation is a non-cash expense. And because depreciation is a non-cash expense, we've got to add it back to EBIT to get the true amount of cash that's available for the firm to pay their interest. You see that? So you could have a firm that was slightly less than one on times interest earned, but by the time we add back their depreciation, now the cash coverage ratio would be greater than one. And so the times interest earned measure is more conservative. The times interest earned measure is more conservative. Uh, but I tell you this, I would not be interested in loaning any money to someone with a cash coverage ratio less than one. Does that make sense? I might be okay with someone who had a high depreciation if their times interest earned was less than one, as long as their cash coverage ratio was greater than one. By the way, who's likely to have higher depreciation, a new company or an old company? If the new company is likely to have high, this is a depreciation expense, by the way. The new company is likely to have greater, because so they're likely to have newer equipment, right? And so the equipment has a depreciation schedule. And at some point, that uh, equipment becomes fully depreciated. 1997, when I take over my little business in Dallas, Texas, my newest machine had been built in 1979. It was 18 years old. And all of my machines were fully depreciated. It would not be fair to compare my operations profitability versus the, uh, someone doing exactly the same thing with brand new machinery simply because they're going to have so much in the way of depreciation expense 
that is reducing their earnings. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, who cares about these things? Long-term creditors. Now, why do long-term creditors care about these seemingly short-term measures in the second one here? You remember what I told you about if I step out in front of one of the bear line buses and I get hit by the... And there's no worrying about the long term if I don't even survive the short term. What causes people to default on their debt if they don't have cash to pay the next interest payment? And so if I'm going to issue a 30-year bond, I am, I'm interested in your long-term health, of course, but my bigger concern for the moment is that you be able to pay your interest this year because if you don't, it's going to force you into a default and we're going to have to force you into bankruptcy. That's not good. I would rather you be able to make your interest payments. And in fact, we see a lot of this going on in China right now. People had uh, sold these bonds and they could make the interest payments, but now the face value is coming due and no one wants to loan money to these companies, especially real estate companies, because they are in bad shape. And so basically the government is stepping in to issue new debt to get money to loan to these people. So putting the, the government's putting themselves between the bondholders and the company because they want to keep those companies in business. That's called extend and pretend. We're, we're buying you some more time and we're going to pretend that you're going to get your stuff cleaned up, right? I'm not a big fan of extend and pretend. You end up with zombie companies, which is how you end up with a decade of lost economic growth like you did in Japan in the 1990s. Oh my goodness. So the other formula that the book mentions under the cash coverage, uh -huh. the interest bearing debt or the EBITDA. Okay. Um, is that what we should be using rather than the cash coverage or is that some totally different? Uh, I would tell you that uh, when I went through this, I selected the ratios that I thought were the most meaningful for analysis. So we don't need to worry about that. I mean, it's good to know. Well, yeah. yeah. By the way, what's the difference between EBIT and EBITDA? Yeah. And yeah, depreciation and amortization. Amortization is something similar to depreciation, only something instead of for equipment and buildings, we're doing it for oil wells, coal mines, things like that, a forest. What percentage of this asset have I used up? So that's what that's all about. In your mind, you can always just consider it to be, uh, it's, it's logically similar to depreciation. Now let's talk about asset management or turnover measures. And the first one we're going to talk about is inventory turns. This is the number of times per year that I sell my inventory. The number of times per year that I sell my inventory. And by the way, it has no units, right? It has no units because anytime you've got the same unit on the top and bottom, they cancel out. The same is true of debt to equity, total debt ratio, things like that. Okay. Now, it is, can someone tell me what COGS stands for? Cost yeah, cost of goods sold. It is the cost of goods sold divided by inventory. The cost of goods sold here is a measurement of the sales of the firm. The cost of goods sold here is this measurement of the sales of the firm. And you say, well, why wouldn't we just use sales? And here's why. Inventory is recorded at cost. Inventory is recorded at cost. So let's say that I buy something for $8 and I sell it for $10. It's going to show up in my inventory at $8. It's going to show up in my sales at $10. But it will show up in my cost of goods sold at $8. So we want to do an apples to apples comparison here. Because inventory is recorded at cost, we must use the cost of goods sold. Now, when you get to your Management 767 class, uh, some of their textbooks actually say sales divided by inventory, you know that's wrong. Now you know why that's wrong. Should you argue with your professor? 
No, just, 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 by the way, my wife teaches that class. That's why I'm telling you not to argue with your professor. <laughs> she comes home and she's like, you wouldn't believe what they argued about today. I'm like, well, they are right. Okay. Okay, so that's inventory returns. Now, let's talk about what would be good. Would you rather sell your inventory once per year or twice per year? Twice. Yeah, or twice per year or four times per year. Yeah, you would rather have higher inventory terms. Does that make sense? Okay, now, we can take that inventory terms number that we just calculated, and remember, it's the number of times per year your inventory sells, and we can figure out our day's sales in inventory. We're going to take 365 and divide by that inventory terms number. Knowing that inventory turns being greater is better, what would we rather have in day sales inventory, high or low? No. Yeah, low. I'd rather have just very few day sales in my inventory. Now, we're going to see that different businesses, different industries will have different measures along these, or different values for these, and it might not be bad. So my inventory turns could be 12, yours could be 400. And you can say, well, you suck, because maybe I'm in a business where the inventory turns are just naturally low. And maybe you're in the grocery market where inventory turns are naturally high. So I'll give you an example. When I worked at the nuclear plant, uh, by the way, nuclear power plant 1991, if we shut down one of the units for one day, it cost us $1 million in revenue. Do you think we would be interested in being able to get spare parts like that? Oh, yeah. So that means someone had to have that part on their shelf, right? There were only a hundred and something nuclear reactors in the United States at the time. How often do you think people actually bought those parts? Yeah, rarely. And in fact, there were many different types of nuclear reactors, so we had parts for all different kinds of reactors laying around. As a result, this stuff would stay on the shelf for years. But when we needed it, do you think we were willing to pay more for it? Oh, absolutely. And so the, uh, the, the profit margin on these things would be higher, but the inventory turns at those firms would be way lower. I'll, I'll show you how urgent this was. We had a time when they spent 40000 I think it was $40,000, to fly in a part to Russellville, Arkansas from Connecticut on a private plane. It was a Learjet and it just had one thing on it, that part. Do you think that company ever spent $40,000 to send me anywhere on a private jet? Hell no, right? Economy class at best. My point to you is this, if it's something that people are gonna need immediately, then you've gotta have it ready to go. Your inventory turns are gonna be lower. For example, another example, the airline industry. Do you think that they want to have spare parts available at a moment's notice? Absolutely they do. So the suppliers of those parts probably have lower inventory turns. But on the other hand, they also charge more for those parts because they are also having to cover the cost of carrying that stock. Okay, so we want higher inventory turnover, lower day sales in inventory. And then we've got receivables turnover. So your account's receivable. Well, let's, let's go back a little bit and talk about inventory. If I could avoid holding inventory, would I do that? Yeah, inventory ties up money because you have to spend money to put that stuff on the shelf. It ties up space and it also um, can go bad, right? Do you know that stuff has a date on it? My wife and I, you'll reach this point in your life, if you haven't already, where you look at medications and stuff, and you're like, oh, crap, that expired five years ago, right? This stuff goes bad. So that's another cost of holding inventory. If I ask you how to increase your inventory turns, mathematically, there are two ways to do it. What are they? Yeah, I can either increase the sales, which is increasing the cost of goods sold, or I can decrease the inventory. Which one of those do you think should be my goal? Decrease. Yeah, decrease the inventory. 
And I'm going to say, I'm going to hammer this home to you. Increasing sales is almost never the answer. Increasing sales is almost never the answer. And here's why. I used to, sales was my last job before I left industry. My sister uh, later on got into sales. We're all sitting at home at Thanksgiving dinner and my sister had just been on her first trip around to see her potential customers. And my mom says, so did you sell anything? What do you think the answer was? No. So sales is, so sales is not like hunting, right? Hunting, you go out into the woods, you shoot the deer and you bring it home. Sales is like gardening, right? Sales is like gardening. You're going to go around and the first thing you're going to do is you're going to prepare the soil and then you're going to fertilize the soil and then you're going to plant the seed and then you're going to hope that some of those seeds germinate and grow. And out of all that work, your success rate will be relatively low and it's going to take a time to get things rolling. So my sister and I just laughed because we knew that sales was gardening. What does that mean about your ability in the short term to increase your sales to make your inventory turns better? Not a lot of hope for that. Now, uh, then I'll have marketing students say, well, we can run an advertising campaign. Sure enough, you could. What does that cost? Yeah, it costs money. It's going to eat into our profitability. And then I'll have someone else say, well, why not offer a discount? And I'll say, because it eats into your profit, right? And so what I'm telling you is there is no way to short-term increase your sales that's not going to cost you money. And so what that means is we need to focus on reducing the inventory. And here's how I want you to think of inventory. I am a crabby artist. You guys probably already knew that. Okay, you can think of inventory like being the water in a tank. And um, the level of inventory is the level of the water in the tank. In order for me to get that water level to go down in the tank, what has to be true about the relative flows here and here? Which one has to be faster? Yeah, the out has to be faster than the in. Now, there are two ways that I could do that. I can either increase the out, which by the way, would be sales here, right? But we said increasing sales is almost never the answer. So it means we're going to be working on this other side. There are two ways things get into our inventory. What are they? Purchases and How's the other way things get into our inventory? Production. Yeah, production. So if we set out to reduce our inventory, we should be looking at decreasing our purchasing and our production. Now, how do I know which I need to do? I need to analyze the inventory. And if the inventory that I'm long on is stuff that I bought, it's really easy. All I do is I pause placing orders for that stuff until the inventory level comes down. And I, whenever I run into one of these situations, I pray that it's going to be the purchased parts and not the produced parts that are causing the bloat. Because it's a whole lot easier to stop issuing purchasing orders than to do what we have to do if it's produced parts. What do we have to do with our production if our problem lies in parts that we've made. Yeah, you got to reduce capacity. And what can that mean? It can mean layoffs, right? So recently Ford figured out that not as many people want to buy their electric pickup trucks as they thought. And they had to go from a two shift operation to a one shift operation. What happened to all those people on the second shift? Yeah, they lose their jobs. I don't know if you've ever laid anyone off or fired anyone. Do you think you go home feeling really great about it? No, no, it's, it's lousy. Okay, now let's talk about uh, what a, a real situation that I got involved in. When I first went to Halliburton, our inventory turns were four. When we looked at our competitors, our inventory turns should have been 12, which means we needed to reduce our inventory by two thirds. 
And most of that was stuff that we produced. Most of that was stuff we produced. Now, we were situated in Duncan, Oklahoma. And in Duncan, Oklahoma, there's not much reason to be there other than Halliburton. So if we laid off people, what typically happened was people would line up down at the bank and just throw the keys from their house into the, the drive through that little thing, and say, the house is yours, because there was no reason to stay there without a job at Halliburton. Now, let's think about what does that, how does that impact us? If we had laid off everybody and shut the plant down cold for a month, what would have happened to our good workers? Yeah, they'd go somewhere else. Uh, there were other jobs, right? And people would have gone somewhere else. Who would have stuck around? Yeah, the losers, right? The cream of the crap. And so we knew if we wanted to keep our good workers that we basically had to keep them employed. We're not going to work them overtime, but we had to keep them employed. So what do we do? The first week we cleaned the factory. We cleaned it top to bottom. It was sparkling clean. You could have eaten off the floor. It was amazing. Now the guys knew that we were basically doing them a favor, keeping them on, right? So they were, you know, whistle while you work kind of happy. Now, at the end of that week, we take a reading on our inventory. It's still too high. Week two, we paint the plant. We pay, keep in mind, you gotta clean it before you paint. The place is clean, now we're like, well, we're, let's paint. And so we made a mistake though. We allowed the operators to choose the colors that they painted their machines, right? <laughs> and so when we got done, it looked like one of those Gulf Coast kind of tourist towns with all the different pastels. Oh, it was crazy. Okay, so after week two, we take another reading on our inventory and we're still too high. We've got nothing left to do in the building. It smells great in there. Uh, we, we, nothing we could do. So, but the good news is we were on a bunch of land in Oklahoma. Land in Oklahoma is cheap. So we had a huge compound. And we went down to the local Orchelon and bought a bunch of those weed cutting idiot sticks. And we sent the people out to cut weeds. Now, I had a third, at the end of the third week, we take a read and we are where we need to be. So then we bring everybody back into the building. I had never seen a bunch of people more thrilled to go to work in a factory than those people coming out of the July sunshine in <laughs> Duncan, Oklahoma, right? Okay, now, we kept all our people. We got our inventory down. Did we spend more money than we would have had we laid them off? Absolutely. Would we have been in a world of hurt had we laid them off? Absolutely. Do you see how that works? Okay. Let's see, so that's inventory and how we manage it. Let's talk about receivables. A receivables is where you have extended credit to your customers so they can buy stuff. By the way, would we prefer to do business totally on a cash basis? Oh, I would. I would prefer that my people pay me right now and I don't have to worry about them not paying me back. I also don't want to have to worry about borrowing money to have the money to allow them to have 30, 60, 90 days to pay. Now, why in the world then do we offer these people the opportunity to buy on credit? It comes down to competition. If everyone in my industry is offering credit, I've got to offer it. If I am in an industry where people don't offer credit, I don't have to offer it. It's a prisoner dilemma kind of situation from uh, game theory. But once, person, once one person in the industry offers credit, what does everyone else have to do? Yeah, they gotta start offering credit too or they're gonna lose sales. So, inventory and receivables are a whole lot alike. We don't want, we would rather not have these things. The only reason we're doing them is to support sales. The only reason we're doing them is to support sales. And so we can calculate something called the uh, accounts receivable turnover, which is just sales divided by accounts receivable. Now, why are we doing sales here instead of cost of goods sold? Because accounts receivable is recorded not at cost, but at your selling price. And so are your sales. So once again, it's an apples to apples comparison, sales divided by accounts receivable. I would rather that receivables turnover be higher. 
I would rather that receivables turnover be higher. It means that I am making absolute best use of my, or as it increases, I am making better and better use of that accounts receivable investment. I can also look at days sales in receivables, which is 365 divided by turns, just like for days in inventory. Day sales in receivables has a couple of other names, one of which is average collection period. Average collection period. Average collection period, that is the average amount of time it takes for me to get the money from the customer. It's the average amount of time it takes to get the money from the customer. So that's days sales in receivables. Now, let's talk about, you could also, it's also called day sales outstanding. I would rather have lower than higher, right? I would rather have lower day sales in receivable. I'd rather get paid right now. I'd like to have zero day sales in receivable. Uh, but if I give you a number, can you tell me whether it's good or bad? For example, my day sales in receivable is 59. Is that good or bad? The answer is it depends. It depends on if I've given them 60 days to pay, it's good, right? They're paying a day early. What if I'm giving them 30 days to pay? It's bad. It's bad. Now, sometimes when I ask students, how do we solve this problem of we've given people 30 days to pay and they're paying in 59, what do you think some students say? Oh, let's just give them 60 days to pay, right? Let's discuss human nature. What do you think is going to happen? Someone has, uh, so uh, Mr. Tsai has been paying uh, 59 days. I've been giving him 30. Now I'm going to give you 60. When are you going to pay? 89. 89 or maybe even worse, 119. Who knows, right? Do you see how that works? When I, was a, when I first started driving, the speed limit in this country, I kid you not, was 55 miles an hour. I drove 65 because I'm bad like that. Now, I drove 65, and then, like a year or two later, they raised the speed limit to 65. You say, oh, good. I'm glad that Dr. Haggard came back to being a law-abiding citizen. Hell no. How fast do you think I was driving? 75. And then they raised it to 70. How fast do I drive? Yeah, and then I'm down in Arkansas, and it's 75. 85, baby. And then I get out in Texas, and it was like 80 or 85 miles an hour in West Texas. And it just scared the snot out of me, but I had to be 10 miles an hour faster. <laughs> okay, that's my point to you. You cannot bring people into compliance by lowering the bar. Uh, and, and next time that we get together, I will tell you how we're going to get people to comply. But let's talk about one more thing. Total asset turnover. By the way, I'd rather have no assets. I have a business. My business has basically no assets, and I love that. Why do we have assets? We have assets to produce sales. And the more sales I produce with the same amount of assets, the better off it is. So we have this total asset turnover measure of sales divided by total assets. The higher that is, the better. So the higher values of that are considered better. Now, if I ask you how to increase your total asset turnover, remember, increasing sales is almost never the answer. What do we need to do? We need to decrease the total assets, right? What if I have idle machinery? What could I do with that machinery? Sell it, right? Uh, what if I had four plants and they were all running at 60%? I could consolidate plants and sell the extra plant, right? Does that make sense? That's how I want to go about improving my total asset turnover, not by increasing sales. Say it with me. Increasing sales is almost never the answer. Increasing sales is almost never the answer. So who cares about these measures? First of all, firm managers concerned about performance. You remember I told you about my accountant Jack bringing me in and raking me over the coals. These are the things we were talking about. And also equity analysts, the, the chartered financial analyst people that we talked about earlier, and competitors. So you can use these things to compare yourself against your competition. Next time, first thing, I will tell you how to get your accounts receivable down. 
I will see you then. <laughs>